You are listening to Kill Hitler, written and narrated by Mark Felton on War Stories with Mark Felton. Episode 2 Colonel Klaus Schenk, Count von Stauffenberg, carefully placed his brown leather briefcase against one of the thick wooden table supports, making sure that it was as close to Adolf Hitler as he dared. The hot and stuffy conference room was crowded with senior officers, aides and stenographers, the huge wooden table festooned with maps and charts. Hitler, pale and drawn, and wearing spectacles, stood halfway along the table listening to the latest bad news from the Russian front. His marked stoop and greying hair made him look older than fifty-five. It was evident to all those gathered in the room that the Führer was becoming increasingly agitated, as Generalleutnant Adolf Heusinger, chief of the general staff of the army, presented his pessimistic strategic assessment and recommendations for the Eastern Front. The conference hut windows were open, for it was another hot and sticky day deep in the marshy East Prussian forest. The date was the 20th of July 1944, and Hitler had only minutes to live. Stauffenberg stood a few paces from his Führer, standing next to 37-year-old Oberst Heinz Brandt, Heusinger's aide, and a brilliant equestrian who had won a gold medal at the 1936 Olympics. Stauffenberg's calm exterior masked his rising panic. Stauffenberg was the epitome, the kind of Wagnerian hero so adored by the Nazis. The Count was handsome, with a military bearing, but horribly disfigured by his war injuries. He wore a black eye patch, and his right hand was missing from the wrist. Most of the fingers of his left hand were also gone. This crippled but proud warrior represented the last chance for Germany. Both Stauffenberg and his fellow plotters had come so close to killing Hitler on numerous occasions. They felt sure that Hitler's uncanny ability to sidestep death could not last forever. One of their attempts would be bound to get him. Inside Stauffenberg's briefcase was a bomb, a British bomb. It was the same slab of explosives that had already been unsuccessfully used to try and destroy Hitler's plane over the Soviet Union in 1943. Stuck into the plastic sea was a British time-pencil chemical fuse, and it had already been crushed. Acid was slowly eating through a spring, holding back a firing pin. A detonation was imminent, but the weapon was not precise. It could go off early due to the warm temperatures of the wolf's lair. Stauffenberg knew he had only a few minutes to leave the conference hut before the bomb detonated. Stauffenberg had no intention of dying alongside his Führer. He intended to survive, so that he could play a central role in the military coup to be launched against the Nazi state in the wake of Hitler's successful assassination, Operation Valkyrie. He glanced to his left at his target, the maniac who was dragging sacred Germany into the abyss. Stauffenberg's face betrayed no emotion. He looked around at General Feldmarschall Keitel's adjutant, Major Jon von Freyand, and muttered something about a telephone call. Freyand and Stauffenberg stepped out of the conference. They went into the telephone operator's room, where a call was placed to General Major Erich Felgiebel's nearby communication centre. This is Stauffenberg, he announced curtly into the phone, appeared to listen for a few seconds, then calmly replaced the receiver in its cradle. Not pausing to retrieve his cap and belt with its holstered automatic pistol, Stauffenberg quickly left the conference building and started to walk towards his staff car parked close by outside. He expected the deafening explosion at any second. This time Hitler would not escape his fate. Stauffenberg had been presented with an opportunity to attack Hitler at the wolf's lair because he was a member of the Führer's inner staff. However, even someone as trusted as the Count faced virtually overwhelming obstacles to kill Hitler. Security at the Führer's Eastern Front headquarters was formidable in comparison to the discreet arrangements at Berchtesgaden. 
It was designed to be overt and intimidating, so that visitors were in no doubt that they were entering Hitler's nerve centre for his most important front. It was also relatively close to the front, so security had to be tight to prevent a surprise Soviet attack. SS Light Commando and RSD personnel guarded all the conference rooms. On the morning of the 20th of July, Stauffenberg was to have had a meeting with General de Infanterie Falter Bühler, Chief of Staff of OKW, in Jodl's house, within Sperkreis 1, the Security Zone 1. Afterwards, the participants attended another meeting in Keitel's bunker. Stauffenberg was then due to report on new replacement army units at the Führer's midday situation conference. At 12.30pm, Keitel's adjutant, Major von Freyand, reported that Generalleutnant Heusinger, who was due to deliver a report on the Eastern Front of the conference, had just arrived on the trolley from the nearby Mauerwald headquarters complex. Keitel announced that it was time to go to Hitler's situation room near the gas bunker. At this point, Stauffenberg managed to excuse himself from the group, as Major von Freyand led him to somewhere private where he could wash his face and change his shirt. Freyand led him to a private room, but Stauffenberg appeared again shortly afterwards looking for his aide, Oberleutnant Werner von Heften, who was carrying the bomb materials in his briefcase. While Stauffenberg and von Heften worked feverishly to put their bomb together, Keitel and the others waited outside the building. Stauffenberg, who only had three fingers on his one remaining hand, struggled to crush the time-pencil fuse that Heften had pushed into the one-kilo slab of plastic explosive. Using specially prepared pincers, Stauffenberg managed to set the fuse off. At this point, an orderly, Sergeant Major Werner Vogel, tried to enter the room to find out why Stauffenberg was taking so long. The Count was nervous and curtly ordered him out, but Major von Freyen called out from the front of the building, Herr Oberst Stauffenberg, do come along now. Stauffenberg quickly left the room with only one bomb prepared, armed and fused, stuffed into his briefcase, while von Heften still had the other slab of explosives and time pencil. Keitel, having grown impatient waiting for Stauffenberg, had gone on to the conference hut, but the Count quickly joined Freyand and the others and started walking towards the security gate. Freyand offered to carry Stauffenberg's briefcase for him, but the Count, looking tense, curtly refused. But as they approached the security gate that led into Sperkreis A, or Security Zone A, Stauffenberg handed the briefcase and its live bomb to Freyand and asked him to place him as close to the Führer as possible because his injuries had left him hard of hearing. Outside the conference hut was an SS Begleit Commando sentry, and nearby lurked an RSD officer on patrol. Inside, a sergeant of the FBB, the Army Protection Service for Hitler, manned the building's telephone switchboard. As the officers entered the hut, they removed their caps and belts with their holstered service pistols and placed them on racks outside the conference room. No one's briefcase was searched, and Hitler's bodyguards did not frisk the visitors for weapons. A few days after the bombing, the RSD, the Reich Sicherheitsdienst, or Reich Security Service, concluded its report on the incident, writing, Any failure of security measures provided against an assassination attempt cannot be discovered, since the possibility had never been taken into consideration that a general staff officer who was summoned to the Situation Conference would lend his hand to such a crime. There were two SS officers present in the room, SS Sturmbannführer or Major Otto Günther, Hitler's personal aide, and SS Gruppenführer or General Hermann Fegelein, Himmler's SS liaison at Führer headquarters. The other 20 men in the room were all army or navy officers, apart from two shorthand writers who would record everything that was said, a minister Franz von Sonnleitner, foreign minister von Ribbentrop's liaison man. Field Marshal Keitel introduced Stauffenberg to Hitler, who shook his mangled hand briefly before turning back to the conference table. Stauffenberg excused himself from the meeting barely two minutes after stepping into the room, on the pretext of making a telephone call. 
Stauffenberg asked Freyand to arrange the connection for the call that he said he still had to make to Felgiebel. Freyand did as he was asked, and Stauffenberg was left alone in the telephone operator's room to speak to Felgiebel. As soon as Freyand had gone back into the briefing, Stauffenberg hung up and left the building. When Stauffenberg left the conference room, Hitler was leaning on the table, his chin cupped with one hand, his elbow on the desk, as Generalleutnant Heusinger described the worsening situation on the Eastern Front. Stauffenberg walked out of the building and across to where Felgiebel waited in the doorway of the communications centre with Lieutenant von Heften. At 12.50 p.m., just as Stauffenberg reached the building, a loud detonation went off behind him in the direction of the conference hut. Oberleutnant Ludolf Zander, a communications officer in Felgiebel's department, was standing near to Stauffenberg and von Haften when the bomb went off. The Count and his adjutant were anxiously making arrangements for a car. The explosion was deafening. Felgiebel gave Stauffenberg a startled look, but the Count just shrugged his shoulders. Zander was unsurprised by the detonation. Tens of thousands of mines had been sown around the Wolf's Lair complex, and wild animals often set them off by accident. The explosion inside the conference hut was tremendous, the British plastic sea explosive packing a mighty punch. Flames, debris and bodies were flung through the open windows, while the detonation reverberated off the surrounding buildings. All hell broke loose as security personnel, shouting at the tops of their voices, raced towards the hut, and an alarm siren started its mournful wail. FBB medics rushed to tend the injured while Stauffenberg and von Haften hurried towards a nearby staff car. The two plotters witnessed the scene of confusion as a huge cloud of black smoke and dust completely obscured the conference hut. Several guards looked skyward, expecting to hear the drone of aircraft engines, for it seemed as though the bomb had to have come from above. Stauffenberg climbed into the back of the black Mercedes, believing that no one in the conference room could have survived such a catastrophic detonation. Inside Hitler's conference hut, the pleasant room had been reduced to a complete shambles. The huge map table had collapsed and was partly on fire. Bits of paper and dust twirled in the disturbed air. The walls and ceiling had also partially collapsed, and the window frames had disintegrated, with wood and glass spread over the grass outside. But the bomb had not done its work. Stenographer Dr. Heinrich Berger had taken the full blast of Stauffenberg's bomb, losing both of his legs. He died later that day. Colonel Brandt lost one of his legs and died the following day. General Oberst Gunther Korten, chief of the general staff of the Luftwaffe, was speared by a piece of wood and also died the next day. Chief of the Army Staff Office, General Major Rudolf Schmundt, was severely wounded, losing an eye and a leg, and also suffered burns to his face. He died in hospital several weeks after the attack. But most of the participants survived with injuries that ranged from serious to superficial. Unfortunately for Stauffenberg and the plotters, Hitler fell into the latter category. The problem for Stauffenberg was the venue. If the situation conference had been held in the windowless concrete Führerbunker, the explosive power of the one kilo charge would have been magnified and probably killed everyone in the room. But because of the stifling July heat, the venue had been changed to the cool and shady conference hut. The use of the term hut is a little disingenuous, as it was built of concrete and brick, but it had large windows and was wood and plaster lined, so some of the power of the blast dissipated through the windows and doors, or was absorbed by the plaster and wood interior. Hitler was blown off his feet by the blast. After the initial shock of the blast, Hitler, a veteran of the trenches, established that he was all in one piece and that he could move. He made it through the wreckage to the door, beating flames out from his trousers and the back of his head as he went. He bumped into Field Marshal Keitel, who embraced him, weeping and crying out, My Führer, you are alive! You are alive! Keitel helped Hitler outside. 
Hitler's singed hair stood on end, his trousers and long white underwear had been shredded and hung in strips like a raffia skirt, and his legs bled from hundreds of wooden splinters that had flown around the room like high-velocity needles. His face was blackened, and he was deaf in one ear, his eardrum ruptured by the blast. He also had bad bruising to his hands and a hemorrhaged elbow, because he was leaning on the table when the bomb had exploded. His right arm was swollen and painful, and he could barely lift it. He also had cuts to his forehead. But he was very much alive, and none of his injuries was life-threatening. As with so many things in Hitler's life, his survival had been purely by chance. After Stauffenberg had left the room to answer his telephone call, Colonel Brandt's boot had connected with the Count's briefcase. To clear some standing space, Brandt, who was standing closest to Hitler, had leaned down and moved the briefcase to the other side of one of the very thick oak table supports, away from Hitler. If the bomb had remained where it was, Hitler would almost certainly have been killed. As it was, the table's support absorbed much of the bomb's blast, leaving Hitler with only superficial injuries. Stauffenberg had also only been able to arm one of the two slabs of plastic explosives that he had carried into the wolf's lair after being disturbed when he and his aide had been priming the time pencil fuse. The other slab remained in von Heften's possession as they drove away from the scene of the crime in the staff car. Dr. Theodor Morell soon arrived to begin treating Hitler's wounds. When the Führer's valet, Heinz Linger, rushed to his master's side, he was surprised to find Hitler composed and with a grim smile on his face. Linger, someone has tried to kill me, said Hitler. The identity of that someone had yet to emerge. Stauffenberg's car passed through the checkpoints out of Security Zone 1 without any problems, the Count bluffing the guards, muttering something about Führer orders of the highest priority. The guards should not have let the car pass, but they were still reeling with confusion after the nearby bomb blast. When Stauffenberg and von Heften arrived at Watchpost South, the southern guardhouse in the perimeter fence, they found their path to freedom was blocked. The FBB army personnel manning the gates had dropped the barrier and placed obstacles across the road. The NCO in charge resolutely refused to let the plotters pass. Stauffenberg, feigning anger at such an insufferable delay, got out of the Mercedes and paced into the guardroom, where he telephoned his breakfast companion, Captain Leonhard von Möllendorf, who worked in the HQ Commandant building. After repeating his story about Führer's orders, von Möllendorf interceded on Stauffenberg's behalf and ordered the guard commander to open the gates. Speeding through, Stauffenberg and von Heften headed for the airfield, where General Wagner had placed a Heinkel HE-111 transport at his disposal. Within a few minutes, they were on their way to Berlin, confident that Hitler was no more and ready to take charge of the coup. You have been listening to Kill Hitler, the July bomb plot, written and narrated by Mark Felton. For great documentary films on a variety of military subjects, visit the YouTube channel Mark Felton Productions. You can also help support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below. 